All right, so today we're going to go over, we talked about on the last podcast, we're going to go over some different ways to actually treat these wounds, and we're going to try to get the a good camera shot and the angles and all that. Hopefully you guys can see all of this stuff. But before we get into that, I'm just kind of, we don't really have anything planned out. I'm just going to kind of grill you okay, and, and let you do your thing. But before we get into that, I want to talk about a little bit about some of these these specialty dressings, like this one right here, a chest seal, and we've got the uh, the cellox and the, and all that stuff. So, and the, what is the other one called? The Israeli battle dressing. That and the and the the wound stuff. Quick clot. Quick clot, which yes. is cellox. That just depends on the name. Brand. Cellox is like granular, right? No, it's a powder. It's they're just coming different names like cellox, quick clot, uh, wound seal. Gotcha. Okay. And we're going to go through some of these dressings. We might even go through. We're not going to actually use this because they're a little oh, bit expensive. But, and I'm not letting you put a hole in me. So, But let's kind of go over real quick. Let's talk about quick clock and all that because we kind of differ on this. Kind of? Kind of, yes. Really? Because I think, kind of? I think there is a use for it and you think there's absolutely no use for it whatsoever. Absolutely not. And explain your position first. <clears throat> okay. My position on quick clot is... It's, it's not necessary. You can apply pressure. Let's say that you have this wound that's bleeding all over the place and you're um, like you're hiking on a trail and you cut your leg really bad because you trip and fall and you're like, I'm going to pull out my quick clot or I'm going to pull out my dressing that has quick clot on it. Well, when you put the quick clot on, Slap it on your arm or wherever. Oh, look, you Big, have a wound. Well, it needs to be a little bigger than that. But. Yeah, but if that was bleeding a lot, perfect example. So you put the quick clot on there and you think, oh, I'm all great, blah, 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 blah. Well, what happens is quick clot, C-lox, C-lox, however you say it, it's, it's like a clay. It's like a powder. So what happens is it gets in here and it coagulates the, the blood. It stops the bleeding. But you need to get it to the to the point of where the bleeding is coming from, whether it's arterial so blood. So it's got to clog the vein itself. Right. So, well, if, if it's venous blood, if it's venous, that means it's unoxygenated. And But if it's arterial, that's the bright red blood because it has oxygen in it. And that's where you see the pumping action because every time... Yeah, exactly. So let's say you put all that quick clot on it. Well, what you're doing is you're... You know, it's it's created, it gets thick, so it, it takes the moisture out of the blood, but also takes the moisture out of your tissues. So it can actually create a burn. Um, it can cause nerve damage. It can, I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's, you don't necessarily need to use it. Now, let's say you have a dressing, you have gauze. Pretend this is our gauze with our quick clot in it. You read the instructions and it tells you, you put it on there and you put pressure on it for three to five minutes. Well, I can take a regular dressing, just a regular piece of gauze, slap it on there. I can hold pressure on it for three to five minutes, which is what you'd want to do anyway, regardless if you use quick clot or a plain dressing. Um, there's less chance of something happening by using a plain dressing. And if you've got to put pressure on something for three to five minutes, why spend the money and get something like quick clot when I can do the same thing with this and not cause potential further damage in the future? And I think another thing with the quick clot, two people don't really quite understand, or a lot of people don't, is that it is a temporary thing. And it it needs it's a foreign body in your body, right? Or yeah. it's a foreign whatever you guys call it. But it needs to come out. Right. It can't just stay there. It's not a here you're fixed, the bleeding stopped. It's it's kind of prolonging the inevitable. Right. So, so and and if the if say you've got access to an emergency room or anything like that, they would have to go in and basically make the wound bigger to get all that gunk out. Yeah, because when the quick clot hardens, it it can actually look like regular tissue in the wound bed. So then, if if you don't have the experience, if you haven't worked with it before, you can say, "Oh, look, it worked, and it made everything pretty." Well, some some of that clay-like stuff, some of the powder, can actually travel through your bloodstream and it can sit somewhere. So let's say that it travels to your bloodstream and it sits in an, an artery or a vein that goes right here, almost to your sits heart. Sits here for a few years. Sits here for a few years and then all it basically forms like a clot. So then let's say that clot breaks off, goes into your heart. Uh. Exactly. So it could kill a part of your, your tissue because what happens is the, the it dies because it becomes occluded, like cholesterol does, plaque buildup in the, in the arteries and stuff of your heart. 
it it makes it so the oxygen oxygenated blood the arterial blood cannot get to a section of your heart so then it dies that's what an infarct is so the infarct. tissue literally dies that's not what i would have said it was but now let's say it didn't go to your heart so you didn't have a heart attack but you're exerting yourself you're working out and that clot that was here well now it comes and it goes and finds itself into your lung which could happen and that's then you have a pe which is a pulmonary embolism which you can die from or if it travels and it goes oh up here goes into your brain you have a stroke and the odds of this happening are not huge or anything but it does happen you're saying there's a chance there's basically. a chance and is it is it worth that risk now this is where we kind of start to differ because i think you're thinking because in like medical terms because you're in the in that setting all the time i'm thinking when there is absolutely nothing but at the same time it, it's that choice of bleeding out or prolonging basically prolonging the inevitable because you have to even if you use that stuff and it works for for that instance you still got to do something mm -hmm. it's still something still has to happen in in a very short time period because it is a short-term fix so i think i i think there is a use for it but it, it would be a very severe almost you're kind of screwed anyway situation if yeah. you have to use that yeah but then i can just take some gauze and slap it on you and hold pressure on you for 15 minutes it's not like we have you know something else that we're going to be doing if we're thinking post-apocalypse shtf situation yeah and a lot of people in the military use this but that's because there are people there is support you know the the medics and all of that these guys are trained for this stuff so in a post collapse situation if you don't have somebody that knows what they're doing and and can clean that out um it's it, not a good thing because your body it's basically going to get infected right because it's going to fight off that that foreign body possibly possibly but i mean there's a lot more you know you can do a lot more damage by using it than not using it so in in my opinion if you're planning on using something like that you I really think you need to, number one, do the research. Number two, you, you've got to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, take an EMT class. Um, become, a, you know, become an EMT. Do first responder stuff. That's not my thing. I'm not a first responder. I'm not an EMT. Um, but I think I have a little bit more knowledge base than, than most people do. Um, well, get that training. There's lots of classes training. you can take. They're yeah. four-hour classes. They're probably... 50 to 100 bucks but it gives you a, a baseline anyway it might not teach you everything but it gives you an idea what to look for when you're looking on the internet you don't want to just go to the internet and type in something and think you know it go take one of these classes see how the professionals do it and then kind of build on that right that way you have some kind of baseline like you said what is it you've always said with the knowledge the you're curse of knowledge no the biggest oh. tool you have is between here or something yeah and the biggest tool you have is your melon yes and you can also be smart enough, just smart enough to be dangerous too. So, yes. and that's a big disclaimer with all of this too. This is not medical advice or anything. I just no. want to clarify that this is just some information ideas and stuff purposes and only post collapse and stuff like that. Some of this stuff like bandaging a wound, not necessarily post collapse, but again, do your research. Don't just depend on us or, you know, articles online, make sure no. you do your research, take a class. It's, it's really worth it to spend that 50 to 100 bucks and take a class and figure out some of the, at least the basics of first aid, CPR, all that stuff. So let's, I'm gonna kind of drill you now, let's get into some of these different kinds of wounds. First, we've got this SAM splint here, and this is a small one. They have large ones too that are actually pretty cool for a bug out bag because they, they're pretty small, they're flexible. You can put it right in the back of the bug out bag, maybe even for a little support. But um, these ones right here kind of show me, say I've got a broken finger or something. You should make it your middle finger if it's broken. This one? Yeah. All right, hopefully you can see this in the other camera. We'll figure it out. But so we're doing my, my middle finger. <laughs> she, the nurse told me to, I have to. So what you want to do, like, so let's say that you've jammed your finger or it's broken or something. These are cool because what I would do is bend it first. So it's, you're making like a cot for your finger and then you can put it like that. And then I wouldn't bend it when he's got a broken finger because that would really hurt if you're pushing on pushing it. That, yeah, that would hurt like a S yeah. SOB. So you have it flat and then you kind of look at how it is. So you're basically pillowing 
around the finger and it makes it'll make it a little bit more tolerable for your your victim or patient oh the wound is on me <laughs> victim and so you it's so we got like a little hamburger bun okay so he can set rest his finger like that where's my coban coban is nice to have because you don't have to use tape with it this one you had it do they have it there it is so it's stretchy and you don't have to have scissors with it so we want him to relax his other two fingers and you don't want to make it tight you're just keep, keeping it in place you're stabilizing it so it doesn't move because when it moves that's when it hurts so don't make it super tight coban or vet wrap can actually get too tight you can um, constrict blood flow you can make a tourniquet with that but now his lovely middle finger is at least stable and it's going to stay that way until we get him to an emergency room or something so they can take x-rays and see what's going on with his finger and that's important because we sometimes we don't realize how much we move our hands and stuff so that just stops me from doing that right because yep if I were it to grab stops the something, joints from moving because that would be a hell of a, a pain feeling if I were to grab something without oh, this and bend it. Oh, it would totally hurt. And it's still going to hurt like right when it happens. So maybe if you have some Tylenol or something, um, I mean, I guess you could use ibuprofen, but ibuprofen or any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So ibuprofen, Aleve, aspirin, they all can create a little bit more bleeding because it thins out the blood a little bit. And they can also um, interfere with the healing process because they delay the inflammation phase. Um, they kind of interfere with that. So, and you need you need the inflammation. That's one of the normal phases of healing, unfortunately. But that's when you get the throbbing too. Gotcha. And like I said, the bigger ones of these, if you had a broken arm or something, you could basically do the same thing like that, or yep. an ankle or a leg. But not yep. with this one. You can't really put two of these together because they're gonna. Flex it's anyway. going to be like a joint, so it's going to move. So it does have to be one one solid piece that's going to actually yeah. help to support that area. But these are really cool because they're they're flexible, um, and you can re I mean you could reuse them. Like right now, we can reuse it, but so you can bend it all kinds of different directions and then push it back to where you need it to go. So if you need to stabilize an area, yeah. All right, now we've got this cool vampire blood and stuff so i want to do say what do you want to do you want to do a pressure wound you want to do a laceration i'll, I'll leave it up to you you got to okay. fix me up though okay so let's say you lacerated your arm so let's give you a wound okay we've done this before not a real one not a real one you're going to tape one of those wound stickers on me yeah so here's his wound ow and then should we give you some blood? Sure, why not? Make it realistic. Oh, it's got a safety seal on it. Should we put something under here so we don't make a mess? Or you don't care? It's my office. Huh? It's your office. I don't <laughs> care. Uh, let's put this off to the side. So, ooh, that looks like this is blood. <laughs> Look, that's fun. I like blood. It looks real. Feeling a little woozy here. What's your favorite thing to say when we do this? Heck yeah. So Dale cut himself. I'm not using the quick clot stuff. But I'm just using four by fours. So we're gonna put this is just pressure. So we're gonna hold pressure on this for at least five minutes. Okay. Okay. And you want you want to push, and it's just solid pressure. Um you don't want to go like this. Because that would hurt like an SOB. Yeah. There. I don't know how much further I can stretch over there, but okay. Okay. So, putting pressure on it. It's been five minutes. You're not on any blood thinners or anything. So, I'm pretty confident we've got the bleeding to stop. I don't need to look up underneath it to make sure the bleeding is stopped. The whole goal is we want to just apply pressure because that will stop the bleeding. No, nothing else needs to be added. No quick clot nothing okay so now i want to put uh i want to put kind of a little bit of pressure on it say i don't have an ace wrap but i got coban or vet wrap same thing this is thinner stuff 
thinner what do you mean lighter or stretchier it's just thinner because this is only one inch coban but it doesn't matter if it's one inch it doesn't matter if it's three inch oh thinner in width yeah gotcha. it's hard to work with a microphone <laughs> i don't have a microphone at work okay well in the shtf situation you won't be at work i don't know if you'll have a microphone in your face either but I might. You gotta adapt. If you're around. <laughs> this is a perfect opportunity to show our dressing change <laughs> skills. I like the thinner stuff too because you can, it works well. Coban vet wrap is cool because it sticks to itself, so it's not gonna stick to the person mm -hmm. or the owie. Now, this feels kind of tight, but not really tight. How tight is this supposed to be? You want it to be kind of tight, but not so tight that you feel your fingers going numb. Because gotcha. we don't want to do a tourniquet. If we do a tourniquet, if a tourniquet is left in place for about, I think, um, two hours is the maximum. Like a real tourniquet. Basically, anything below the tourniquet is dead. You're going to get rid of it anyway. So, we our goal is not to have you lose your arm. Our goal is to stop the bleeding and let the pressure do its job okay so let's say this wound needed it didn't quite need stitches but it needed a steri stripper a couple of those this would be the first step you would take yes you you take care of the wound first right yeah you, you want the bleeding and... to stop so now let's say now it's... before this would you have sprayed it out with saline or anything like that you could have but my main thing is to stop the bleeding so let's put pressure on it and get the bleeding under control let it get kind of coagulated and then let's say two hours later we can look at it and see because then that should make it enough that it's just going to be kind of oozy okay okay so it's been two hours you're not feeling woozy anymore not feeling woozy and i'm actually using bandage scissors sorry i know i have made that tight so i like these kind of bandage scissors because they have that little tip on them they have a tip that makes it so i'm not going to cut you um, I'm only going to cut the bandage. It acts as a guide. A little safety tip. Yeah. Safety tip. Get it? Safety tip of the day. <laughs> so now we're peeling back the dressing. And there's a little bit of blood on there. It's all dried blood, which is good. And if you weren't my husband, I wouldn't be worried about... Um, I mean, if this was on myself, I, I'm not, I'm going to wear gloves if it's on somebody else, but you're my husband. I'm, I know where you've been. I I'm think. not going to sue you. Basically. You're not going to sue me. And so you think. But in a good sense, you know, in most situations you really, you should have gloves on just because you don't want to give him any, I don't want to give you anything, but for argument's sake, and I don't want to use all of our gloves. I'm just, I have gloves on. Okay. Okay. So your steri strips. So for steri strips. Now this this wound is not necessarily bleeding anymore. It's just kind of it's just oozy. it's dried. It's kind of a little oozy. So then I'm going to take alcohol. You don't have any alcohol. Use a little bit of the hand sanitizer. And that's okay in an open wound. I'm not going to use it on the wound itself. I'm going to use it on the edges, just to clean it up, to get the sticky stuff off the edges. The goo, the, the, the wound goo? Yeah. <laughs> and then that's going to keep that area around the wound cleaner. If you have Silvazorb gel or your hydrogel or silver gel, any kind, remember I have gloves on. Because if you're going to put anything on the wound, you want gloves on. Put a little bit and then one swift, little one movement. One swipe. That's it. That's one all. Swip. One swift. That's all you need. And all of the stuff that we're using, you don't need a prescription for it. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it in medical supply stores. You can find it on Walmart. I got this at Safeway. It's like five bucks. Cool. Dude, I did it again. Steri strips. So the steri strips, these are 3M. These are the wider ones. They come in different sizes. These are one half inch wide by four inches in length. Um, Depending on how big of a wound you're, you know, how big of a cut you're dealing with. Are you talking length? I'm talking width this okay. way. Because if it's, what I typically do is cut this in half because it's sterile. 
Again, I have gloves on. So I'm going to cut it in half. Let's oh, a little bit over half. Because I don't need, I don't need four inches. I mean, you could, but you don't need it. And it seems like if you have a smaller area that you're pulling together, it the tension is is better with the smaller pieces. Makes sense, yeah. So I peel them off, put it on one side of the wound, and pull to the other side. So you're basically pulling this part of the skin over. Over this way. Kind of closing up that wound. Yeah, so I'm pulling it, and then that's going to bring the wound edges like that. It's kind of going to tent them a little bit. Now, you can actually use this, and I, I think it's a better idea because I don't know how to suture. That's, you know, not my expertise. But right after the wound happens, you, you let the, you know, make, let the bleeding stop and so that the steri strips are actually going to stick. Steri strips can act like sutures because they have those little strings in them. So it gives a little bit more um, strength to it. So this one I pulled and we went this way. So the next one I'm going to use... I'm going to put on this side and I'm going to pull this way. So what I've done is kind of created a zigzag of pulling that skin taut together. Yep, makes sense. And then on the last one, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to come on this side again and I'm going to pull that way. So, and one thing, do you notice what I've done? When I put the steri strips on. Moved my skin close together. I don't know what. So you can see there's still gaps. Oh yeah. And I want the gaps. There's a reason for the gaps. So if there's like any yuckiness inside, I want it to be able to come out. I don't want to close it up and seal it up. Don't completely. And that's why you clean it as well before we do this, right? Yeah. Because you don't want stuff growing inside and being trapped inside. Right. So then if I were, you know, I get a little overzealous and I want to make sure I want to cover the whole thing up. Let's just cover it all up. You're trying to kill me here. Yeah, I know. I'm going to lose my arm, and it's all your fault. And I will sue you. Okay. Married or not, I'll take you for everything you got. Okay. So now, and I've seen stuff like this where they, they cover the entire wound, incision, whatever it is. Well, then stuff oozes out, and it keeps it next to the skin. Well, what happens when your skin stays moist all the time? It's going to get macerated. Good job. So the maceration, it, if the skin is all too moist, it can't heal. It can't knit together. So now all of this stuff, and I ha I've seen it where they, they have a cut, so they have an incision, then you take off the steri strips and you can literally pull it apart because it can't knit together because it's so, so wet. So just by taking off, sorry, that was hair, huh? A little bit. Oh, the steri strips work good. So just by taking off a couple of the steri strips, Oh, that is actually a wound right there. Look at, you see, I That's pulled that apart a little bit. Fighting with my dog. I yeah. see. I've got all this on video. So I know. I'm, I have video evidence now. Yeah. But so now there's, it, it, it can actually come out. You can let the stuff come out. And then you can take a four by four, two by two. It doesn't matter what it is. Just because you don't have a 4x4 four four right now? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, you can make do with whatever you've got. You can use Hypofix. You can use an Ace Wrap. You can, if you've got cast padding, fine. Use it. You just want to keep it covered. Because we've got the steri strips on. It's doing its job. Use use what you've got. And then you can put an Ace Wrap or Coban over it. But if um, you're, And what is this? This is just cast padding. Okay. So it's just, it's padding. Whatever you have though, basically. You yeah. Can, you can, I mean, you could do whatever you got. Um, Ace wrap or. Ace wrap, Coban, anything. This stuff's cool. Look at that. <laughs> you need a masked man. If you have a head injury, you wrap it around your head. You could, it would look cool too. Okay, so let's, that's basically this, right? Yep, that's a, that's a cut that would require stitches and you don't have stitches and you can't get to someplace where you need stitches. Okay, so let's do. That was kind of a puncture wound, right? That, that was, was a kind laceration. of laceration. That was a cut. Is the same process? It would it be the same process for a puncture wound? It can be. Here, I'll get that off. Oh, be careful. 
because I don't want you tugging your skin apart there. Do you see that? You're being too nice. Okay. Now, and I mean, really, because you actually have a cut here. So I don't want to pull that cut apart. It's going to be okay. I know, but that's you're Can't putting that. pressure in that brand new beautiful skin that's knitting together. You're pulling on it. You're tugging on those beautiful little skin cells. Let's move on. Okay. But that's really a wound. Look at it. <laughs> no. Okay, so let's do a let's talk about third degree or first, second, third degree burns and how to treat those. And we're gonna go through the, the first one a little bit quickly because everybody kinda knows that. But we wanna address that too. So a first degree burn would be like a coffee burn or something like that, right? It could be. Yeah. Anything that the skin is red, the skin is still intact, but you'll notice it's red in appearance. Kind of like my my laceration yeah. wound right there is already red. It's so already it's red. Yeah, but that, I just keep looking at that. But anyway, that's beside the point. I'm so burned. You're burned. Okay. So you're burned. You're going to take it and you're going to run it under cold water for like five minutes as much as you can. In a SHTF situation, that may not be a luxury that you have, but you want to cool down the area because you don't want the burn to, co to continue burning. So you've done that. Let's say you've got some silver gel, no triple antibiotic ointment, just silver gel, um, hydrogel, which is just moisture, it's adding moisture. So you're going to put a little bit of the, oops, gel, and then we're going to run it across the burn. And, and not one. scrub it on because not that's going to hurt like an SOB. In yeah, there. and you just want to lightly go over it. Then you're going to take um, a semi-permeable moisture dressing this is adaptic this is a good dressing for burns because it will it won't stick to the skin so we're gonna now this is still sealed we're gonna put that on his wound his burn cover it with some gauze but yours shouldn't be sealed we're just we don't want to waste all your first waste. aid supplies on yeah <laughs> yeah so um and then you can either use tape tape around the edges you can use Coban, you can use an Ace Wrap, um, but that will keep it comfortable for the patient. You can also, so now let's say you got a second degree burn because your coffee was really hot. Second degree burn is you're gonna see blisters. They are, will either be sealed or they'll, they're, we'll say that it's roofed. That means that the blister is still sealed. The fluid inside the blister is sterile. So you don't want to pop the blisters. You want to make, because those, yeah, if they, once they pop, then you're opening yourself up for infection or all sorts of different stuff, right? Yep, because you're you're dealing with an open area of skin. And remember... If the, they do, they do, though. Right. If it is open, it's open. But if it's not, don't pop it. So same thing. But this time, we're going to run his hand under, his arm underwater for 10 minutes. Um, cool water, not cold. You don't want to freeze or burn him. And you don't want to kill the tissue. If the water's too cold, it can freeze the tissue so, and do more damage. So then we're going to take our occlusive dressing again. Let's say that he has blisters and there's still, they're still fluid in them, so it's like a big bubble. Zeroform dressing, which is it's yellow gauze. That stuff is cool. It's got like Vaseline in it almost. And you put it over top of it. What will happen is it will keep the blister moist, but your body will reabsorb that moisture, the fluid from the blister, and it will collapse and it'll look like a little flat area of extra skin. So that's good to put over it. Right now we have adaptic, so we're doing that. This is gonna prevent anything from sticking to the blister and ripping off the skin, creating an open wound. Then we'll take our gauze, we're gonna put over that. And again, you can either use Ace Wrap, you can use Coban. You can use Hypofix, you can use tape if they're not allergic. Duct tape if Duct you have to. Duct tape if you have to. And now he's got a nice little wound dressing covering okay. his burn. Now a third degree wound is completely different, right? You don't run that underwater. Third degree burn is bad because you've got all the levels of skin. The first, so the epidermis and the dermis are gone. They're charred. Um, back when I was working in a restaurant, I back when I was like 18, I was carrying a big bucket or a big pan of hot boiling hot soup and we had those swinging doors and i kicked the door open while somebody else was on the other side kicking the door open Ugh. so i dumped the soup on my arm and what i did was went like this and wiped it oh my gosh and the, skin the skin and everything came, came that's basically a third degree burn right yeah well and um did and it I hurt probably shouldn't have done that did like a, like a yeah a little bit then that wasn't a third degree burn that was a second degree burn 
Well, are you talking immediately? Actually, immediately, no, it didn't. Okay. And then that that night or the following day? Then it hurt. Like crazy, yeah. Yeah, because um, what happens on, on a third-degree burn, there's nerve endings in there. So there's not really a lot of pain because it's dead. Evidently, there wasn't because I wiped it. Yeah. <laughs> so. So on a third-degree burn, this is not something that you really can or should treat on your own. In a post-apocalyptic situation, you don't have a choice, then you can. But third-degree burn is bad, and you need medical attention. Um, so let's say we are post-apocalyptico and... Apocalyptico. Apocalyptico. I love that movie. So we're post-apocalyptic, and we can't do anything. So, I mean, the best thing you can do is keep the person comfortable. Um, if you have saline, that's going to hurt like a you-know-what. But you've got to hopefully cool the tissue down. So then, again, we're going to get our silver wound gel. Maybe not putting it deep in the wound because it's going to be deep. And you might even see bone. You might see tendon. Now, see, on mine, I didn't, it didn't quite go that deep. Yeah. But so, I didn't. I was the tough guy. I didn't go to the doctor. We basically, I probably treated it like a second degree wound. Mm -hmm. Just wrapped Which, it a little bit and checked it the next day. And yeah. actually let it, before we even wrapped it, it just sat there, basically. Yeah. Well, and that's really dangerous when you leave it sitting there because then you have exposed... Um, tissue so flesh that, yeah and so that's that's a huge open area that infection can get in and that's the whole idea of your skin is to keep infection out keep homeostasis thermoregulation of your entire body so and when you're when you have third degree burns involving so much percentage of your body you're going to get dehydrated um infection can sit in so it's just it's best not to get a third degree burn gotcha so you basically i mean if in in an, a today environment, um, soak saline in, in, or soak gauze in saline, throw on as much as you can, keep it covered, and get to the hospital. In post-apocalyptic SHTF situation, um, I would cool the skin down first. I'd probably put adaptic over it. I'd probably take gauze that has been soaked in saline because you want to keep it moist because you're going to get dehydrated. You're going to lose fluids. Put that all over it and then loosely wrap it probably with more clean gauze um, in any area that is exposed, meaning like tissue so you can see meat and that's what it'll look like. You don't want to put, um, you want to make sure that there's something covering it as far as like nonstick. Not with tape or anything like that. Yeah. So, and just loosely wrap it. And then you're probably going to do dressing changes at least twice a day. And cross your fingers and hope everything and, and turns hope out okay. okay. No infection, stuff like that. Yep, and they don't die from dehydration and fluid loss. And we'll probably do, a, we kind of run in long, so we don't have time to do the infections and, and all of that. But we'll probably do something like that, say a burn, a wound like this, doesn't get, does get infected. You know, what do you do at that point? Right yep. now we're just kind of showing the basics and everything, but... Um, before we get out of here, though, I want to go over this chest seal a little bit and maybe uh, maybe like like gunshot wounds or stuff like that. I think in a situation like that, are you game for that? Or, yeah. I think in a situation like that, it really is. I mean, you're you're in a world of hurt and literally the you know, it's a you can only do what you can do. So, again, I think that, you know, a quick clap might be an option, but know what the hell you're doing. Lisa says no, but. Um, but explain what would you do with with this chest seal? Why would that be necessary? The chest seal is necessary because um, not so much because I, and when I first heard about these, I thought it was for like this. I'm think picturing this huge wound like this. My whole like chest your is whole gone. Chest is open, and I'm like, that is not going to work. Why are you going to use that? Go to the hospital. But m more so, um, let's say you're hiking down a trail. And you're clumsy like Dale and a, a tree branch punctures your chest. And so then you have this puncture wound coming out here or heaven forbid, if you got stabbed with a knife or um, you got shot. So let's say you got shot. You're laying on the ground. Well, it's not too shot. You, you got you got stuck by it. Twig. I'm kind of enjoying that whole stabbing me thing there. Yeah, like. that's cool. <laughs> but um, this is really cool. You don't have to have something like this. This is nice. Um, it's very fancy. We're not going to open it because it was it was expensive, wasn't it? A little bit, yeah. It was like five, six dollars. Not nothing terrible, but 
So, and the main reason you would want to use this, your body, so your whole body cavity, your whole body, your mid, upper body, upper body, mid section. Yeah, your trunk, the trunk of your body. It is, it, it has organs. your heart, it's organs, all the important stuff is right here. So, if your body goes into shock, it's going to shut off your limbs first. It's going to preserve this. Everything that makes your body the stay core. alive. Yep. So, now he has, he hit, he has this like puncture wound. Let's say it's right there. There's this puncture one right there. And it's like, oh crap, that looks like hell. You, you can see that? I'm just gonna get a, there's my puncture okay, one. There's this puncture one. Can't really see that, huh? But go ahead while, go I, ahead while I wound myself. So the main thing with the puncture wound is, there you go. what's happening every time he breathes in, take a deep breath, <laughs> and then he breathes out. <sighs> And, and when he's breathing in and out, what happens is, it, depending on how deep that is, you can hear it's. They call it a sucking chest wound because you'll hear the air going in and out. That's enough. We got the <laughs> okay. sucking part down. So, but what happens is then air is going in and it's pushing on the lung and pushing it over. So then you can get um, a pneumothorax, which is where the lung is basically getting smaller and smaller and collapsing. So if someone's complaining of shortness of breath, they have something like they have this puncture wound and they're complaining it's getting harder to breathe, most likely this is when you would use a chest seal. So if you have one of the fancy ones, you don't want to clean anything off. The whole idea is to get that thing sealed. So this one is really cool. You know, go ahead and open that up. Well, I'll, I'll take the last. To. I'll buy some more. And what's cool is you can actually, this packaging, don't throw anything away because it's sterile on the inside. You can actually use, let's say you had this part. If you have a piece of plastic that's this big, you can use this for a chest seal. I'll show you how. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to have to show me that because doesn't isn't it a chest seal? It breathes out, but not in. It breathes out, yeah, but it doesn't allow air to come in. So I'm wondering how you would do that without a valve on the regular piece of plastic. Oh, I'll show, show you. Me. Yeah. And you have gloves on right now, right? Well, it... At this case, it doesn't matter because yeah, I'm not true. touching anything. So, and I really don't want to do this because it is super sticky. See how sticky that is? That's all right. Throw it on the shirt. No, you can't. It's, dude, it'll totally. Throw it on the shirt. All right. So, what you're going to do is you're going to open it up. He's going to be laying on his side. This is cool because it has the valves on it. So, and it has this little white piece. So, that can stay on for now. But what you want to do is you want to cover the wound. No. Oh. Just kidding. With Didn't that, hurt. and you're gonna you're gonna seal it, okay? So then this, you take that off afterwards, and what? And you want to do this when they are exhaling because that's gonna give them. You're gonna. Oh, that's really sticky. I'm leaving that on. Okay. So, but now what happens? This is a valve. So what happens? It'll hopefully restore the pressure in there to normal it'll allow the air out that's been in that went in when through the puncture wound so the lung doesn't deflate but it's not letting anything else in okay. but it's not it's not letting anything else in now as far as dressings do you apply this directly to the skin yes and then after that what do you do after that then you're gonna take this which actually came in this dressing, which is really cool. Then you're going to take an ace wrap or one of the battle dressings, the Israeli battle dressings. Then you're going to wrap it around and then you're going to, that's how it's going to stay in place. And we're going to do a video on the Israeli battle, battle dressing too. We just don't have one right now, but those are really cool and yeah. can do the same thing as this right here. So yeah. So not the valve part, but no, but the, this part. The dressing. So, but now let's say, uh, Oh, we just ripped off your wound. But, oh. but see how sticky that is? Yeah. Okay. okay, so now you need a new piece of duct tape because this is dead. Okay. This is dead. We can't even reuse this. That's I'm sorry. That's really cool, though. I think this would be a good thing to have in your bug out kit. I was kind of skeptical at first, but that's good. But I wouldn't want to take that off. I mean, put it on your skin and yeah. then be the one to rip it off. Ow. <laughs> So let's say you don't have that fancy chest seal, but let's say you have um, a dressing, a sterile dressing. So what you can do, oh, I'll just put the gloves on because that makes me happy and you happy. I don't really care because it's not real. 
Thank God it's not real. I'm telling you. That, that would have hurt. Sucked. I'd have been passed out by now because you just ripped that chest seal right off me. I know. Do you that see was... how that's... Look at the... Kind of took the fuzzies off your shirt, too. That's pretty cool. Could be a lint brush. Could be. Expensive one. Very expensive one, but yeah, whatever. So let's say we have this sterile dressing. Um, you open the sterile dressing. This inside of this plastic is sterile. So Dale's got that sucking chest wound. I hear it that it's, you know, I hear that. Yeah, I hear the air whistling through it. So, and you can actually have the person help you with this because they're most likely going to be, you want them laying on their side. We can't do it for the video though, but you're going to have three pieces of tape. It can be duct tape. It doesn't matter what kind of tape it is and they can help you. So what you want to do is you want to put this over the wound and you want to make sure that it's going at least two inches around it. So he can help hold that in place. And what I'm going to do is on the edges of it, I'm going to tape it to his skin, but not to his shirt. This is his skin, I but I didn't it, want to embarrass him. I think I blew my nipple off. <laughs> you did too. <laughs> Somebody shot me in the nipple. <laughs> so now he, he held that off. So now what's happening, we're putting tape on three sides of it because that is going to prevent any air from going into his nipple wound, his nipple <laughs> puncture wound. But when he exhales, that will allow the air that has gotten in there to come out through the bottom. Then you would go ahead and put this over to put a little bit of pressure on it. So you're going to wrap it around their chest and around their back. Don't make it so tight that they can't breathe, but you want it to be snug. So even if you don't have a chest seal dressing, you just made one. Cool. Yeah. A nipple dressing. A <laughs> nipple dressing. That's right. All right. Well, that... It was quite a few, and I think there's probably more too. If anybody has any ideas, um, let us know, and, and we'll get we'll put Lisa to work, and she'll she'll dress wounds and stuff like that. But I think I'll make MacGyver dressings. That's right. We that could cool. do that. Yeah, that's what that is. It's totally we, MacGyver dressing. We could do a whole video on MacGyver dressings, um, and we didn't even mention we've had this sitting here the whole time, but we didn't even mention that having headlamps and lights. I mean, it's like throw that on and like if you're working on say this wound right here it's you know it, it makes where you can see everything just really really clear <laughs> i just totally went like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you can see a lot better and it's hands free so even though i just wiped my eyes with my gloves because my, totally... my eyes i just infected myself but you can move it and i i have um very very i can see everything that's going on in that wound and I still have my hands that I can. So you can wrap do a really up. good job. Yep. Yep. Um, do you have anything else that that you can think of, or is that kind of it this oh, week? Oh, I'm making Don't a stroke. Don't stroke me. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Nope, that's it. You're, I'm in my element. I love this stuff. Cool. So, like I said, if anybody has any ideas and wants to know how to do certain wounds or dressings, anything like that, um, I'm sure we'll do another video in the future as soon as we get the Israeli battle dressings. Um, and some of the other stuff but for now i think that's it um for this week next week what's going on next week do you know i have no idea yet you haven't told me i don't either well actually we're doing sptv oh yeah next week we're gonna have um uh, ken on from the prepper podcast and he's got a battery bank or a battery setup for his cellar his storm shelter um, which is going to be pretty cool. He's going to be doing it on his cell phone. I've got mine. We're going to kind of talk about the process and all that should be pretty neat. We've also got um, just a, a podcast listener that wants to join in too. So we're going to do that and, and we'll have you monitor the forum. So if I get anybody to be wants the monitor. to get on and chat a little bit while we're doing it, that would be cool too. Ask some questions. Lisa will we'll monitor that, but it should be pretty cool. I'm like the hall monitor. You are, yes. You're a very good one too because it worked out. I completely forgot about it last time. And You, you were totally like, were like, squirrel, yeah. boom, gone. You're like, hey guys, question. And I'm like, hey, hey, there's a question. So with that, I think we're out of here this week. I appreciate everybody listening. And until next time, take care and prepare. Goodbye.